Hey, welcome back. Good to see you again. Welcome to the bench. Hope you're all well. Um, what can I say about this? This is a realistic monster receiver. This is the STA 2100D. Now this has got a little bit of a interesting background. Um, Real, realistic came out with the Radio Shack came out with the STA 2100 back in 1979, and it was basically the same thing. Um, monster receiver. Uh, let's see, it had a nice specs, 120 watts a channel. So for 1980, what they did is they took the basic 2100 and they added a Dolby FM circuit and they renamed it the 2100D. And this is what we have here today. So they ran this one from 1980 and 1981. And, but that was right at the period where all the manufacturers were retooling for digital. The uh, Realistic released a digital receiver. I think it was a 2200 and it had uh, digital tuner, had MOSFET power amplifiers, and that was a really desirable unit if you ever get your hands on one of those. But this one here um, kind of lost its appeal just because it has the analog tuning. But it's uh, it was right at that period when everybody was on the big bandwagon rush to get into the digital movement and the analog gear was kind of left behind it wasn't ignored it was just kind of left behind and uh, people were moving away from it this thing is a beast uh, i just about broke my spine putting it up on the bench i don't know what it weighs i should look it up but um, this thing is uh, a massive massive receiver and uh, like i said these these monster receivers usually measure more than 17 inches. This one measures about 20, 20 and a half inches with the wood sides, 19 without. So yeah, it's a, it's a monster. Realistic likes to put the real uh, veneer wood on theirs, on their receivers and gear. Gives it a nice touch. And then they have the classic aluminum knobs and, and face plate. And uh, this is a, a nice unit. A little dirty now this came uh, to me from um, one of my clients he brought it to me he thinks it has low power output because it shouldn't it, it, does, it doesn't seem to be doing what it, it should be doing 120 watts a channel he thinks there's a problem with the amplifiers he bought it used off another person who demoed it for him and he said he had uh, demoed it with the um, feeding it from a computer, uh, an audio signal from a computer. And he said it worked fantastic when he had it demoed. But then when he got it home and hooked it up, he was uh, less than pleased with its performance as far as power output. He says there, one channel has a hum in it. So I'm hoping it's not um, this receiver and it was probably maybe something with his cable. Cables were defective or uh, broken. But we're going to put it on and turn it on and test it out and see how it's working he also said go through it if it needs anything do it okay um now i'll have a look at things like capacitors and uh, the lighting on here but uh hopefully we don't have to change too much on this because you don't see many of these receivers around and uh better if they're left in in uh, pristine condition it does need some cleaning. Uh, it's dirty. You can see it in the glass is kind of fogged up inside. We remove all that, take it all apart, clean it, and make it all sparkle again. And this thing will be a stunner once more. So let's uh, hook up some speakers and see what's going on with this thing. Okay, she got it hooked up the speakers, and we have it set up for phone on one. Everything's good. Speakers one. Let's see what we got here. 50 watts, relay kicked in, We're stable around 55 watts, okay, you got a buzz in the left channel, right channel, channel 
pots are a little scratchy. He said he wanted the pots dealt with too. Okay, let's see how this performs on FM. A lot of nothing. Bit of a dirty tuning capacitor. It's picking up the strong stations. We're not getting any any stereo yet. Let's try AM. working great but we still have that let's try phone on one again that's the left channel let's try phone on two same thing auxiliary we're getting a hum on the right channel on auxiliary So we got some grounding issues inside. Left channel's quiet. Right channel has a hum. And then on phono, it's the opposite. Okay. Um, now, as far as power output, I can't try it on my little bench speakers. They're only rated for 10 watts or so. Uh, we can do a power test on this. But first, let's open it up and have a look inside and see what work has been done to this thing, if anything. Okay, so here we are with the lid off. I have to stand way back to get a good frame of everything because this thing is a monster. So we've got two power amplifier blocks and a pair of bolt capacitors right in the middle. Uh, where do we start? This little shielded box here looks like it is phono stage. It's completely shielded except for one side. And I can see inside here looks like phono stage. And we have a tuning block here. There's a... What is this? This is a six, seven gain capacitor. And uh, our tuning, our uh, front end, tuner front ends. And then we have, over here, we have all our intermediate frequency and all of our other components for the tuners, demodulation, demultiplexing, I mean. So that's all there in that big board. Look at the size of this transformer. It's just huge, 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 huge. Okay, so we have two power amplifiers here. And right off the bat, I can see this side here, all these transistors have been replaced. Okay, and on this side, I can see they are all originals. Original transistors here, replaced here. So obviously somebody blew up one of these channels, trying to impress his friends maybe, who knows. Uh, one thing that jumps out at me is these crappy old Delcon capacitors. These Korean capacitors that Radio Shack used. I think there's going to be a lot of... I don't know, these are hit and miss. These, these, uh, I'm not impressed with these Delcon ones. Now, I have a power supply board here. And I can already see... Not on a lot of them. The light's not great, but uh, you can see the heat's already eaten away at a few of them. Why is that camera not working? Okay. So when the when the outer shrink wrap shrinks even further, you know it's been subject to high heat. So what do we got here anyways? These are 
15,000 microfarad at 71 volts. That's a lot of wall up there. Uh, across the front, we have tuning meters and lamps. You can get tuning meters and tuning meters and lamps from the top. We have a board here that's all switches. That's where the switch banks are. There should be two boards there. And then buried at the very bottom, we have our tone board and volume control board. Everything's buried, buried, buried. Uh, along the back, not much going on. Inputs for the tuner. Everything's down low on this. We got some uh, power on this side. You got a fuse. And courtesy outlets. Everything's down below. So we're going to have to take the bottom off, have a look. So here's a look at the bottom with the cover removed. We've got access to both power amplifiers. Looks like you can just plug them in. We have uh, positive and negative rails. Blues are ground. Yellow is probably our speaker output. And this one's color coded different, but these modules look like they come out easy. Uh, nothing going on here. This is all bottom of the tone board. Everything here is quite a big, large PCB board. Doesn't look like anybody's worked on this. There's some circuit glue that might need to come off. Looks like it's starting to peel anyway, so it's not really doing anything. It's peeling. This circuit glue can uh, become conductive. We all know that and can wreak havoc with these traces. So we can remove all that. We don't know if this has gone. See some of it's pretty bad up here. We can do that. Uh, we have these connectors. These push on connectors for this is our switch gang. This here is our uh, input selector. And uh, there's our big switch. We've got six, six gang switch here, doing all the switching for all the different inputs, all these connectors. These might go, these might go dicky on us. We might have to just clean these a little bit and then we'll clean the switch. Um, yeah, that looks good. Our power supply board from below. We got access to four fuses and all those crappy caps. I think the board would come out the bottom if I needed to service this. There's two brackets, one here and one here. I removed the screws, the whole thing would come out, hopefully. I think it would. So somebody did work on this one amplifier on this one channel. And uh, I don't know, they replaced all the output devices, but I don't know, they probably replaced drivers too as well. Uh, if, if the amplifier is gonna grenade, it's gonna take out a lot of stuff. Like it's going to be resistors burned out, transistors shorted. So they probably went through that and got it working again. I don't know if it's done right. I'm assuming it is. It's probably done at a repair shop. So can't uh, can't fault them for anything here. Uh, power input. I got this thing unplugged. Yeah. So I think to start, I'm really curious on what's going on with this power supply if we have clean power coming out of here if we got bad caps we could be getting hum and uh, maybe just rebuilding the power supply would solve all our problems but then there's also the bigger problem of caps everywhere else that are these Delcon caps I just I'm not a big fan of them and uh, they're Korean made and they are 40 43 years old now 42 years old, so they are done. Uh, the owner said, if necessary, just replace them. Uh, I don't think there's too many in here. There's some on this power supply board. There is a board here, I think it's a protect board, protection board. There is a relay and there is more transistors and caps on here. So I think this is doing the protection work right here. This is doing the power supply. This is doing the power amplification. This is doing tone control and line level amplification and switching and got our tuners up on there so it's pretty 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 well laid out pretty easy to service uh, let me get my cap checker and we'll start poking around here and see if we can find uh, a reading on some of these caps yeah so I went through and spot checked a bunch of these caps that were in the power amplifier 
and they're getting pretty tired let me tell you and then this power supply again I found uh, one that was bad and a few that were pretty weak so I think for, there's not very many caps in this thing uh, there is the seven on each power amplifier so that's 14 and there's a cluster on the power supply board probably another 20 or so um, let's see here the protection board protection board looks like it has three three or four caps on there five maybe tuner well we can go through the tuner and spot change any of the bad ones a lot of these are power supply for the tuner um, tuners usually don't rely on electrolytics just for cleaning up the power rails so we can go through and check some of these and that's pretty much it a little tone board we can do the tone board as well so recap on this one wouldn't be too bad i think i'm going to go that direction and do it so i'm going to have to order some of these special caps these are 100 microfarad at 80 volts i don't think i have 80 volts i know i don't have 80 volts i have 63 and i'll check and see if i have hundreds i don't think i have, i stock 100 volt caps they're kind of a specialty thing but these high power amplifiers have high high voltages on the power rail so you need to have those caps so I'll see if I have any of these in stock. If not, I'll order them and then they'll get overnighted and uh, I can get this thing started and done. All right. Let me start by removing these power amplifiers. I'm curious as to this one, as to what was changed. This one looks like it's all stock original. So here's the first cap I pull out. It's a 470 at 35 volts. Measures 437 down on the our microfarads. That tells me these caps are drying up. It should have a ESR of about 90 milliohms, and here we have 255 milliohms. It's quite a bit higher ESR. So I think there's my justification right there on the first cap. I'm gonna keep going. This is the power supply board. And I just pulled it out to have a good look at it. Uh, there's some crack solders on this power transistor. Every, soldering looks good on everything else, except I think the uh, caps have turned to, to garbage so i think we're going to go through and do this all right so i finished uh, recapping the power supply board and it went pretty well no drama no surprises it's pretty easy access once you pull it out it's got this rat nest of wires but still um so yeah these are all been replaced all the ones i took out and tested they all had esr two to three times what they should be so pretty tired caps and they all stunk too they had some kind of weird smell to them when you heat them up i don't like that but uh, this is all done now um, i have the power amplifiers out as you can see there's two big empty holes here and they're going to be worked on tomorrow when my new caps come in this is the one that's been worked on and somebody's been changing transistors here we got Toshiba transistors in here now. A004B and C004B. Those are the drivers. And somebody's been doing some writing on the board itself. All the components that have been changed. So yeah, I'll get this done. They got uh, seven caps on each one. I'm going to take this apart and uh, inspect the back side too. I'm hoping there's no surprises there. Um, as far as grounds go, we got this big star ground here on the on the between the two filter caps. Okay, and they also had another star ground here off on left field. This was screwed down to one of the heatsink bolts. And there's another star ground. So you shouldn't have two star grounds. I'm going to see if I can move all of these ground wires onto this one and eliminate the two star grounds. You should only have one in a, in a piece of equipment. I don't know why they did that. I guess it's not. But anyways, I'll, I'll, do, I'll try doing that. I think I have enough wire here. I can move a lot of these over here and eliminate this one altogether. It shouldn't be tied to a heat sink bolt because that's aluminum and it doesn't have the strength for that screw so this is all done this can go back 
and put that back. Now this here is the phono equalization amplifier stage and it is part of the input gain switching. So this whole assembly has to come out as one before I can work on it, which shouldn't be too much trouble. I think I have to remove uh, the, the shaft from the chassis, remove that one bolt in the front of the switch and it looks like it'll just pop right out. Yeah, it's all loose. And of course I got wiring to disconnect. It's all uh, modular plugins like this. So it's not bad. I can just plug them in and unplug them. So we'll do that next. I want to do the protection board. It's under here. So I'll have to remove this cover and uh, everything's wired from below. So I think, I think it can go through or else I can just leave it here and flip it up and down and we'll work on it that way. But I'm probably gonna work on this next. All right, so I got the uh, protection board out and it comes out fairly easy. It's got a bundle of wires holding it, but it, it does have lots of room. You can pull it out the top. Uh, this board has a number of functions. It has the relay, the speaker protect relay on it. So I pulled that out. We're gonna service this. Uh, it's got the circuit for driving the relay. It has, um, circuits for attenuating the headphones, the signal for the headphone jack. It has uh, the meter drive circuit, I'm pretty sure. This is all meter drive here. And uh, th these connections go off to the power meters in the front. So it's got a multi-purpose board and uh, not much going on here. There's a couple of caps, one, two, three, four, five, I replaced. Um, so I'm gonna go through and service this relay reinstall it, clean the board, and make sure I don't have any cracked solders here. It looks pretty good, but I am finding a few cracked solders here and there just because uh, these boards were wave soldered and uh, some of the spots, uh, the solder is a little, little sparse and weak, so that's where they crack first is where there's um, low amounts of solder. So we'll do that. Let's uh, let's uh, let's uh, let's check the contact resistance on this before I do anything to it to confirm if it's a, a good one or a bad one. Okay, so here's a look at the. There's actually four sets of contacts on here, and uh, they're wired in parallel. So um, there's four sets of contacts, and they're wired in parallel. So we have actually two, and they're doubled up. So here's the first one. 0.97 milliohms, 100, and it's kind of floating around. Let's try it again. 112, 90, 80. So it's, it's, if I work the contacts on the relay and try it again, it goes down to 47. So there's definitely a problem with those contacts. Let's try the second contact. This is 110, 100, it's floating. Same thing, 90 is, the more you work the relay, the better it gets, right? Okay, so let's try this. Yeah, down to 80, it needs to be cleaned. Let's try the other set of contacts. Let's try the, for the other channel. And we'll do the first one here. And we are getting 23 ohms, which is unacceptable. Okay, so let's try the second contact on the, oh yeah, this one. This channel must be cutting in and out because look at the resistance on these contacts. 15 ohms, that's no good. Let's work it a bit. Still, it's not getting any better. Nope. Yeah, it's just all over the place. That's terrible, terrible performance for our speaker relay. That one channel's pooched. Okay, so we'll disassemble this relay and we'll clean it. All right, so let's uh, pop the lid off this. It's gonna be a little difficult, right? I think I need. Okay. 
this side. There we go. Come on, you're loose. I don't know why you won't pull out. There we go. So here's the contact arrangement I was talking about. We have left and right channel, or sorry, actually, this is, uh, this is the right, right channel, left channel. And uh, we have two connections here, but four connections here. So there's two sets of contacts for each channel. And they're wired in parallel so that they uh, pass a lower or higher current, a lower resistance. So these are gold plated. Let me see here. Gold plated and they look really clean. So I think just maybe a, a good cleaning will bring these back. But that, that right channel was definitely bad. When you're getting uh, over 10 ohms on a contact resistance and that's wired in series with your speakers, you can imagine what that does to your output of your speakers. And uh, I'm, I'm sure the owner was experiencing problems on the right channel cutting in and out. So let's clean these. I'm just gonna use the paper, the piece of paper folded in half and slide it through and saturate it with contact cleaner and rub it back and forth. I'm not going to use any abrasives on these because uh, they're plated, gold plated. So we'll see how they clean up with the, uh, the least evasive treatment first. This relay is actually the cause of many, many problems for people. Um, these speaker protect relays because over time the uh, contacts will oxidize or get dirty and they stop providing a low resistance. And uh, that's when the problems start. So let me get set up for this. So for today, I'm gonna use a Electrosolve contact cleaner. This is zero residue. And this is the stuff I like to use on things like this. It leaves no film behind, so it can't cause you any problems in the future. You just insert the paper between the two sets of contacts. If I can get it in there. All right position that about so and then we'll saturate this paper you got to kind of work fast this stuff evaporates really quick and close the contacts drag the paper through and I can see it's already pulled away some trash over here trash here and do this a few times okay this side, this side of the paper is already dried up all right so let's have a look Looking at it, it's not going to do me any. Okay, let's check the contact resistance one more time with the meter and then we'll see. All right, so here's a look at the left channel. We're down to about 15 milliohms, which is good. It's acceptable. Anything less than 20 milliohms is, is good in my books. I'd like to see it around down by 12 or 10 milliohms, but. That's not bad. Let's try the other one. The other contact. 16, 18. Yeah, you gotta remember these are wired in parallel, so they'll be probably half of what that is in the circuit. Okay, so let's try the right channel. The right channel was the one giving us problems. Let's try the right channel. Okay, we're still high. We're on half an ohm on the right channel but it's gone down considerably from the over 10 ohms we had before so let's see the other contact here yeah we're still high on these ones so I'm gonna do a second cleaning on it I'm gonna get those uh, contacts on the right channel down to the 
below 20 milliamp level, that would be happy with that. All right, so I cleaned it about four or five more times and it's starting to respond now. This one contact on uh, this side here is being uh, troublesome. The other three sets are good, but uh, since these are wired in parallel, um, that other contact will carry the load for that dicky one. It's not really dicky, it's just didn't want to come clean. I did several passes on it. And looks like we have some dust inside the cap. I've never seen that before. wonder how dust is getting in there. It was closed. But now it's time to snap this back and we'll reinstall it. Here's the part number for the relay. If anybody asks, and we'll just uh, snap this back in the board, solder it in, and we'll be done. Bottom this out, and I will solder that up. That's good. So I'll give this a clean and we'll uh, get a good inspection with a magnifying lens and we'll put it back together. All right, so here's one of the power amplifiers. We have tandem outputs and these transistors have been replaced. MJ21193s, MJ21194s on semis. We have this thing here is thermal cutout switch that's embedded in here with silicone and uh, that's an over temperature switch if that reaches a certain temperature probably 80 or 90 degrees celsius it opens up and probably what that does is it kills power to the receiver as a protection thermal protection and then we have our power amplifier board and we can see there's a number of things have been replaced here and uh, the previous tech has done some uh, ciphering on here He's got part numbers B6, I can't read that, uh, 68 ohm resistor, 22 ohm resistor, 68, those ones have been replaced, 22, um, these two transistors have been replaced, and you can see, probably, I don't know if you can see this, a skid mark here from the smoke damage from before, probably blew out and it made a nice left a nice coating of smoke residue on the board. Uh, caps are looking pretty tired. You can see this cap here, heat shrinking has shrunk even further, which tells me this is sitting in its natural position like this, so all heat's rising and these caps will get cooked. So we're gonna replace all those seven caps. Uh, we're gonna service the trim pots as well. These are a high failure rate things um, these trim pots if, if they go open it could grenade your amplifier which we don't want to do that ever um, this transistor here seems okay but this one here seems loose I don't know if the if the uh, yeah it feels really loose it's flopping around there it's not very good we're gonna have to secure that because uh, if that continues to flop around in the wind, they'll eventually break the uh, copper trace underneath it, if that's what's happened. Let's have a look. Uh, connections, we got B minus, our speaker output, earth ground or common ground amplifier ground let's call it and b plus 
and then we have our two transistors here, two transistors here, and each transistor has its own emitter resistor. Uh, pretty straightforward for a tandem output. I can just flip this backwards and we can service everything. And you can see it's been worked on. The board doesn't look damaged, but why is that one loose? Yeah, we got a broken, the uh, copper trace is lifted on this one and this one and all three of them. I think this one's cracked. So we're going to have to rework these three connections so that they're secure and uh, yeah. Pretty dirty. Lots of dirt. You got your four transistors and you have your bias uh, feedback re transistor here mounted on the heat sink but it's not even mounted it's just up in the air so I'm going to thermally bond that to the heat sink so it's it's better tracking and aside from that the board desperately needs to be cleaned yeah, rosin flux everywhere I don't see any cracks in the solders at the moment but that usually don't reveal themselves until after you clean the board you give it a good cleaning you can see those cracks a lot easier so I'm just going to start with replacing caps, set this up like this, have it stand up and then I can start replacing these caps. I want to, I'm curious about this one here, how bad it is. And then we have circuit glue we need to clean off as well. So this is 100 microfarad at 80 volts. Let's see how bad this one is. So it measures 108 microfarad, 108.5, and 662 milliohms. And that should not be that high. It should be down around 200 milliohms, so that's about three times the ESR that what it should be. So that's the reason why I'm replacing a lot of these caps is because they're done for. It feels light too. It's like they're drying up. Okay, so I'll get started on recapping and uh, I'll bring it back in later. All right, so here's that transistor. This is the holes, the pads for it. This one here is damaged. You see that? This one here is lifted. And this one here is ripped. So, what do we do here? Um, this is the transistor. And I think the leads are going to be long enough. What I can do is I can just push it in, bottom it out, and then, well, here I'll show you. Put this on in, orientate it the same. Let's see, it's Uh, that's exactly what I thought was going to happen. If we can get these to lay flat. Okay, just going to bottom it out. Push the pads down to the board flat. I'm not going to try gluing them or anything because I have rosin flux and everything underneath it. It's not going to stick. So what I'm going to do is just going to scrape back some more copper. Expose some more copper here. It's going to give it more to solder to. I'm going to lay the lay the lead down on it. If I can get this cleaned off. Let's see which way will it take this one. I'll take this one sideways. If you can lay the leads down opposite each other, it gives it more strength. So let's scratch this one out. Okay, this one. And this one. That piece I just might remove because it's just flopping in the wind here. Well, 
you know what, maybe I'll just leave it. Okay, let's clean this. Okay, let's bottom this out. And let's lay these flat. Lay this one flat. We should have enough lead length here to do this. Let's lay this one flat. I pity the guy that has to change his transistor next time because this is going to be easy to remove. And then we'll lay this one sideways. We can actually connect it to that pad. There, let's solder this up. Can you guys see that? Let's solder this one up. Let's solder this one up. And let's solder this one. There. Give it a good clean and inspect it. This one, middle one, didn't take. We have to resolder that one. So let me try scraping back some more. solid. It's good. None of them are moving. They're all solid. I'm going to leave it at that. All right. I am done with this board. Everything's been recapped. And it did a bit of cleaning here. Not too much. I think it's all good. This has been cleaned. Everything's ready to go back together. I did inspect it and I didn't find any cracked solders. So we can just put this all back together now and uh, move on to the next one. Here's the second power amplifier module. And this one looks untouched. It's got all original parts. And let's have a look at the underside of the board. We pull this off and we're gonna recap this one too. This one's got lifted traces too and uh, on the transistors, it must be something See that and what else do we got going on here we got some crack solders here what is that that is this transistor we got two lifted pads there we have to do the same kind of fix as we did up here the other one and uh, these pads look good 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 so we got crack solders, lifted pads. What else do we got going on here? I didn't see anything else. Everything else looks fine. Okay. Just dirty. 
we'll get through and we'll do the same thing for this one. So I have the same lifted pads on this amplifier module. It's kind of unusual to have them, unless it's maybe a weakness. But this one here, um, this one's this pad in the center ripped right off. I don't know if it was cracked off or if uh, it's something when I was cleaning. dirt out of here. So what I did, these pins were quite oxidized too, so I took a screwdriver and scraped them back to get the bright shiny stuff back again. Let's put this together, mount it the right way. And I'm going to push through probably, I'm not going to go right bottom, I'm going to push probably half of it through just so I got a good, probably about three millimeters of lead length on this side. So we can fold these ones over. I'm gonna fold this middle one back this way. Okay, and then this one here is gonna go this way. And this one's gonna go sideways again to the other pad. should give it enough anchor so it doesn't flop around in the wind. Okay, let's solder this. should be a lot better now. Try wiggling it. Everything's solid. Okay. Now there's one thing I noticed about these boards. I don't know why Radio Shack did this. You've got two modules, they're supposed to be identical. But if you look, if you put them side by side, they are mirror images of each other. I don't know why they did that. They're making two separate boards. One for right, one for left. They could have just used the same board for left and right. Uh, as long as the pinout is the same. The pinout is opposite on these, but that's that's not an issue because you could just wire it to to match the pinout. I don't know why they did that. Some engineer at Radio Shack uh, or Tandy screwed up here. They could have did a big cost saving. Instead of making two separate boards, they could have just used the one. Anyways, okay, this is all done now. I noticed these two heat sinks the screws to the board, these were really loose and the heat sinks were, were loose. So I tightened them down. Uh, everything else has been done, the recapping. Um, yes, so now it's time to clean. I'll clean this board. And um, I'm gonna anchor these big caps with a little bit of silicone. These big caps are just a little bit, they should be anchored because if they're not, they're gonna eventually crack the board or come loose and uh, everything else is done here i still need to treat these two trim pots they are open to the elements so i'm going to treat them if they don't respond i'm going to replace them so let's, let's get on with cleaning here all right so going through this one module this is the original the one that hasn't been repaired uh, the heat sink compound is dried up and I'm going to repaste these up, clean them all up, repaste them, put them back together. And then I think this one's gonna be done. Okay, power amplifiers are done. I finished cleaning up whatever I could. Everything's nice and secure. I uh, actually, let's see, flip these over. I replaced three of these silt, uh, not silt pads, but they're mica, mica washers because they were damaged. Look at the damage on some of these. These are from the factory. 
and rough handling. You can't uh, handle these rough because when they split and layer like that, then you get uh, in air inside them and then they kind of insulate the... So I opted to replace three of those. Now I could have went with sill pads, but I, I don't know. I like the original look of, of mica. I don't know, you guys probably have opinions on that. What do you guys think? Do you prefer replacing with sill pads all the time? Do they perform better? Uh, do you use do you use um, compound on sill pads, or do you just put sill pads on dry? Um, let me know what you guys think. Um, these were all torqued down. Everything looks good. Uh, I'm going to put this aside now and uh, work on something else. Another thing you should notice. Since these are mirror images of each other, you can't mix up right and left channel. If you do put the right amplifier in the left channel spot and you connect these wires, you're in for some uh, fireworks display because you have uh, B plus on the inside here and B plus on the inside here and B minus, B minus. And if you mix those up, I can imagine it would be plus minus, oh, what is it, 60 some volts. Be, uh, well, it would be over 120 volts, and it would be pretty catastrophic. The input selector switch and the phono preamp comes out as a unit. Um, there are probably six wires. I think you need to desolder. The rest of these are, no, there's more than six. There was, uh, I think there was one, two, three. There was like 11 wires you needed to desolder from this. And uh, the rest of these are connectors that plug in, a lot of plug-in connectors. And you have to take photos, draw pictures, where all these connectors go, because there's a, like a, a nightmare. It's, it's just like a nightmare here. Um, but once this thing is out, we can fully service this switch and these components. But to get the tone board out, you have to remove that first, right? So, and then once the tone, the, to the selector switch and the phono preamps out of the way you can uh, remove the uh, tone board so you have to remove these two screws from this switch the nuts from the pots uh, there are there's two switches here you need to remove the screws these three pots need to be removed and then you have your main volume pot down below you have to remove the nut from that as well and then you should be able to back this out enough so that you can get the potentiometers past the, the chassis and out it comes and then you can fold it out and do your service. Yeah, it's not the most friendly thing but it does work. There's a lot going on here that's why uh, a lot of switches, a lot of different controls and yeah, it's, uh, so it's time to get these tired old caps out of here. Mm -hmm. So this uh, function switch here is proving to be a challenge for me. Uh, I tried cleaning it and deoxing it just from here, but it's all open and then you got a full access, but it's just not, I'm pulling out all kinds of dirt. Let me give you an example. If I can find a spot here. A lot of dirt on the, um, the rotating parts and the contacts. You can see there's all this crud that's this black crud that's in there on the switch contacts and the deoxid can only do so much. So what I opted to do is I'm going to remove this switch, disassemble it. It's really easy to disassemble. It's just got two screws, two long screws and uh, the whole thing falls apart. So what I did is I desoldered it from the board with my solder sucker and uh, that took a few minutes but then you know eventually you get it worked to the point where you can remove the switch as a unit just like that and i can inspect the bottom side here now which i couldn't see before clean the board but uh, this here now i can get at some of these And I think I might disassemble it because you've got, there's six wafers here, but there's 12 switches from the, from the reading the silk screening on the board. And I want to make sure all these switches are hundred percent. 
and I'm not gonna I can't even see inside some of these so I'm just gonna remove these two screws uh, I got these numbered 10 4 6 5 1 11 and that coincides with what's on the board and they all orientate the same way green on one side brown on the other and when you pull these apart you also have to orientate your um, your rotor you have to mark your rotor which which ways up so that it doesn't get mixed up because you could be 180 degrees out of phase here and it wouldn't work so i'm going to go ahead and take this apart and uh, let's see what we can do for for this thing Yeah, and we got spacers here too. So we got short, short, long, short, short. Let's remember that. All right. So we got our spacers. What I can do is I can start disassembling this and just laying it out. Lay them out in order. I'll service them and then put them back on in order. The only thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to mark the tops of each with a pen so that they don't get mixed up. I should mark the inside of that. Yeah, that's a better option. And pay attention, your cleaners doesn't remove this ink. So now it's just a matter of taking one at a time. I'll show you how filthy this thing is. This is black. I can actually get in here now and clean all this dirt out on both sides. Oops. Okay. Filthy. Now I can properly deoxys with just a smallest drop. Don't have to use excess. Okay. That one's done put it aside and we'll put the other one in i'll do this for each one and then reassemble all right now i got all my wafers cleaned now it's just good to give the uh the ball assembly here a lubricate with some grease you can't see what i'm doing i bet i'm just injecting grease in the little areas where the ball travels Okay, I think we're ready to put this all back together. So let's put our screw. And we have a short spacer. And make sure your um, rotors are all orientated the correct way. So we're gonna put this one on. Short washer. Okay. 
if you keep it all laid out, if you order it came apart, you shouldn't have any troubles. Long spacer. And I think I was, I'm happy I took this apart and cleaned it because uh, you said the crud that I was pulling off those uh, wafer switches was uh, not good at all. So we're going to get this. This switch should work perfectly after we're done. Now we got a really short spacer here, two of them. And then we have our end cap. Let's put a blob of grease on the end. And then this provides tension for the assembly. Let's do one side at a time. Okay, you're going to want to snug these down. Don't go crazy on them because you're going to crush the uh, wafers. Just snug them down pretty good. There we go. Perfect. Ready to reinstall. Have a look at these connections here because manipulating these boards, pulling it out of the other printed circuit board, you might have cracked some of these. So with the lens, have a good look. And I can see a whole bunch cracked here already. So I'm just going to go through with the soldering iron and touch those up again and make sure that they are not cracked. And uh, actually I should have done this before I bolted it all together, but it makes it kind of awkward now, but I will go through and solder some of these back up it doesn't take much just reheat the joint and apply a little bit of solder and it'll reflow it and then that crack goes away okay so at this point I'm done everything I need to do to the audio boards I've done worked over these two switch boards I've worked over the tone amplifier and also worked over the phono amp and everything can go back in now I'm starting to reassemble put these back um, I did run into a couple problems with these PCB boards though kind of a I thought maybe it was me being a little aggressive with the soldering iron all these pads were lifting off but I actually pulled one of these boards out and inspected it before I touched it and the pads were already lifted so at the factory, they were having problems getting these pads um, to stick to the board. There was even a bodge here on this one potentiometer that was from the factory. And I found another one that was broken away. I don't know if I did that or if it was broken previous, but I fixed both of those. And I fixed this one. There was one here that was broken, a pad. So I did those repairs. Now it's just a matter of cleaning this and putting it back in. I removed all that um, conductive glue that was on the board. And I think that was a huge part of the problem when I was with the hum on this receiver is we had uh, on these long traces here from the volume pot over to this side, the input and output section. I don't know why they did it that way, but um, there was a blob of glue here, blob of glue here, 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 here. And each one of these was crossing all these paths. And I think it was becoming conductive and um, leaking current. 
So that's all gone now. I'm going to tack these down with silicon so that they don't conduct any current. And I'm going to clean this all up. And a lot of places where I removed the conductive glue, it also took off the solder mask. So I'm going to repair the solder mask in these areas with some UV setting stuff. And I'll get this all put back and um, we should be done with it. Then I can uh, reinstall the power supply board, re put the power amplifiers back in, they're done. Uh, and then I can flip it over and I can focus on the tuner and the lamps. All right, everything's back together and we can do our setup for the amplifiers. So I got my meter connected to the output of the uh, right channel, I believe. Okay, going on. Just gonna let that settle. Relay clips in. 100 millivolts. And it's going stable around 110. Okay, so let's see if I can zero this out. Very touchy. I'm gonna leave it at that. It's rated right one or two millivolts. Okay, let's do the other channel. I'm tapping off right at the speaker output before any relays or switches or anything like that. So, okay, this one's a lot better. We got. 15 millivolts. Let's zero this one out. Touchy. This one doesn't want to settle. Okay, I got negative. Turning it clockwise rises raises the voltage up. Right there, nope. There we go. It's gonna have to do. All right, let's do the bias now. Okay, according to the service manual, I should be getting nine millivolts across one of the emitter resistors. But I have my voltmeter connected across both of the emitter resistors. So we're going to double that and we're going to set it for 18 millivolts. So here we go. And that adjustment is back farther on this board. I just need to turn it up. Actually, I'm going to let it, I'm going to let this settle first. I'll come back in about 10 minutes and then we'll adjust it. All right. So this has been on for about 10 minutes and I'm just going to, it's stabilized right around 20. So I'm just going to turn it down a little bit to 18. If I can get my screwdriver in here. There we go. Eighteen millivolts. That's what I want. That's my big hand. How's that? Okay. Got five millivolts. Let's turn it up. A little too far. There we go. 
Perfect. Okay, our power consumption is right at 57, 58 watts. So uh, when I switch it to FM, I need a knob on here, I can't turn it. When I switch it to FM, this lamp comes on. All these lamps are good. They're just really dusty and dirty. So I'm gonna go through and clean all those lamps and uh, clean everything up. The, uh, the light pipe is dirty too. So I'm just gonna clean everything, make sure it's all sparkly inside too, as well as outside. I switch, I can hear that read relay clicking on and off. I guess it must mute the, uh, the amplifiers as you switch. Dolby FM. Okay. Good. One of the hardest things to do when you're putting one of these receivers back together again is cleaning this dial face. And it has to be absolutely spotless. If you have a fingerprint smudge or a piece of lint, uh, I'm guaranteed as soon as you turn it on, you're going to see it and it's going to bug you. And, uh, you know, and then especially once you put the glass on, if you, once you put the glass on and it even magnifies it more, Let's see if I can get this on. I got a knob on here. That's why. Okay. Let's try this. So yeah, it has to be absolutely spotless inside. So put it together, light it up and have a good look. And if you see anything, any speck of dust or lint, uh, take care of it now. Okay, we're all back together. Time to try it out. Okay, so we're on AM. Uh, I have speaker A selected. Let's turn this on. I have a relay click. How come I have nothing on? There we go. Left channel, right channel. And developed. Derek Keeter, Andy Pettit, drafted. Uh, Were, you know, sad or, or happy. Odelia turns 51 years old today. Um, an interview. Okay, sounds good. Let's try FM. And family at ground. Already locked in on the stereo signal. Don't have any antenna hooked up though. Uh, plus, check us out on Facebook and Instagram for a weekly. Let me get a little bit of an antenna here. Okay, we got a little bit of antenna. Let's try from the low end of the band. That one never comes in. That station, the first one there, that is never picked up on my area. That's a low power FM station. It's working great. Doesn't sound like we have much bass, but then that could be my speakers. Well, that sounds good. It's a good separation there. Quite weak.
I don't think Dolby FM has any effect on uh, today's uh, signals. Um, so it's kind of a useless feature. Let's go 402. Same thing, auxiliary. Auxiliary is silent on both channels. Let's do a power test and see how this goes. Let's turn on my signal generator. Everybody's favorite thousand hertz tone. We still have a scratchy pot. Okay, let's set up for a power test. I'll uh, put the second camera on and then we can get going here. All right, you're all rigged in. Uh, let's try this out. Still using my 1000 Hertz tone. There it is. Shut that off. Turn on the, uh, on the uh, resistive load, eight ohms. And you should be able to see it on up on the scope there as I turn it up. Here it comes. I'm clipping there the right channel which is the bottom clips sooner than the left I don't know it might just be a pot imbalance Let's set it up right like so and I'm drawing uh, let's see here we're drawing 518 watts and we are outputting 34.08 volts RMS on the left channel just gonna let this go for a while let this warm up. Uh, power meters are not equal. I'm going to have to adjust these. This one's showing almost 200 watts. This one's down around near closer to 100. But these meters are not accurate at all. They are just a relative uh, indication of what's going on. So let this go for a while. And uh, everything sounds great so far all right so this has been on full power for five minutes uninterrupted and uh, our heat sinks are just starting to get hot I can still keep my hand on them but they're they're starting to get a little warm now but my load on the other hand is I can't even approach it it's I would burn myself if I touch that so I think uh, the amplifier is working great we still have a little imbalance between the two Let's have a look and see what a square wave looks like on this thing. Okay, so there's a thousand hertz square wave. Let's turn this up so we can see better. So we're not going to go full power. Let's have a look at the square wave on this. big difference between the two and that might be in the tone controls themselves
That concerns me that they don't look the same. I think I have, might still have a problem in that left, that top amplifier. Let me try a higher frequency. Okay, we're at a thousand hertz now. Let's go up. We're losing amplitude on that top amplifier. We're only at 11 kilohertz. Let's go farther up. Twenty-two kilohertz. We pretty much lost our square wave. And you can see the difference between the two. Okay, another thing I wanted to check is I'm feeding a signal into the auxiliary input and I'm scoping off the preamp output. And I want to see if we have a balanced equal signal on both channels and it looks like we don't. looks like one channel is completely different from the other with regards to is it the mid range the base trouble it's definitely not a balance here Okay, so here's a look at the power amplifier. I fed a square wave signal uh, directly into the input, and you can see it's a nice, clean square wave. No problems with that amplifier. Slightest bit of overshoot on the leading edge, but that's not a problem. Our amplifiers are fine. I tested the inputs on pin 10 and 11 and the inputs are equal. I tested the outputs on pin 24 and 26 and they are not equal. And it led me to believe I might have a bad pot in here, but the, the main issue is not in the base frequencies, even though I do, I did measure down around 100 hertz and there's still a difference. Um, mostly the, the difference is in the mid-range and treble. Now I checked the balance control. The balance control is the first thing on the input of the preamplifier and it's working fine. When on, on 12 o'clock position the signals are e equal so that's r ruled out. Now Realistic in their wisdom created this preamplifier. It's got a six gain, two, four, six gain pot and four of these gangs are for the volume. They have a volume control on the input and a volume control on the output, which uh, I guess they're trying to reduce noise when it's turned down. So that might be a problem with that volume pot. Also, I tested the switches, the tape monitor switches, the um, tone uh, hinge switches across the turnovers. They're all fine. Everything's fine with the switches. Now it leads me to believe I might have a bad component in here that is shunting the signal to ground or maybe a weak transistor or a not a tolerance resistor or something like that. So for the second time, the preamplifier is coming out and I'm going to remove it and we're going to do some uh, more tests on the components and see if we can figure out what's going on here. I should be able to remove it in one piece and have it all connected and I should be able to run it this way and then I can do my testing. Okay, so I did a little bit of head scratching here and did some work on this preamplifier. I did quite a bit of work actually. Uh, I went through and I tested all the resistors on the left channel and I replaced six uh, resistors that were out of tolerance. These are 5%. Are they 5%? Yeah, they're 5% gold band. And I replaced uh, 
four of these were 2.7 megs and these measure out at about 3 meg. They were quite a bit out. I don't think that was a problem. It's probably a contributing factor but not the problem. And then there was two other ones. I did replace one polystyrene cap that was out of tolerance too. Uh, they're supposed to be 100 picofarads and uh, one measured 100, one measured 105 just over 105 and these are supposed to be five percent so i replaced both actually i replaced the the 100 picofarad with another one that i had in stock and they're both closer in tolerance with each other they're not at 100 they're at 105 108 so it's better but i'm going to turn this on and you can see the improvement i've made with the uh, amplifiers and uh, you can see I got both channels superimposed on one on top of each other and uh, I turn it down and the amplitude's the amplitude's good now I'm still battling this little bit of a um, discrepancy on the high end of the uh, frequency band you can see the blue trace has a little peak and the yellow trace has a little rounded edge and if I hit the tone or the treble you can see how it changes so they're not tracking the same and that is the uh, potentiometer I'm pretty sure of it so what I've done is I've added a, a 1 meg trim pot on top of the left channel treble trim uh, pot and I'm going to adjust this with a screwdriver until we get equal balance on both channels so i'm going to turn this up and reduce its resistance and you should be able to see the yellow start to peak up right about here if i turn it too far you can see it peaks up too high so what i want is to just uh, match the other channel that's exactly what i'm trying to do here is match the two so that they both track the same. And I think that's better now. You can see that they track each other. All right. So I'm gonna remove that trim pot carefully. I'm gonna measure it and I'm gonna tack in a permanent resistor. One last step I have to do is calibrate the power meters. It's pretty simple. Feed it a, a thousand hertz tone into the auxiliary uh, have the amplifier on. Disconnect the speaker because you don't want to hear that 100 watts of a of, uh, thousand hertz. But you turn it up until you get 28.3 volts RMS on your voltmeter. Uh, and then you come back here. Left meter, you're going to tweak this back pot here. And uh, just tweak it until you the needle lands on 100 for 100 watts. And that's good on that channel. I'll switch it around to the other channel and I'll do the same thing for the right. All right, so here we are at the end of this one. Uh, this was a good one uh, for me. It was a lot of uh, enjoyment working on this this beast. Um, learned a few things about realistic equipment and uh, really enjoyed fixing this one up. So some things I didn't show on the video that I'm just gonna mention here just for completeness for the, uh, the owner, because uh, probably good information to pass on to him. The auxiliary hum that was experienced on the auxiliary, I had a hum on the right channel, that's gone. And I think that was due to the um, conductive glue that was on the preamp board. It was what, six or seven spots there where it was covering a bunch of traces. Remove that, I think that's gone now. Meter lamps. Uh, the meter lamps were working until I took them out, start cleaning everything in behind and clean the lamps themselves. And then I put them back together and two of them were burned out. So I made a choice. I'm just going to replace all four of these uh, meter lamps. They are 8 volt fuse type lamps. Uh, the originals were 300 milliamps, but I put in 200 milliamps. So they're slightly dimmer. Not a big deal. You still, they still light up pretty good. Uh, if you go to FM, you can, all the meters are, are good. A um, little bit less power consumption about a third less on those lamps, not a big deal. And uh, hopefully long life too. Uh, the Dolby lamp, 
Dolby FM lamp was burned out and I didn't see that till actually till the very end of the video um, when I actually pursued it and I replaced that lamp so now it's working. Um, not that that feature is any use to anybody today. It's kind of a dead feature for this receiver but it's just to make sure it's complete. Um, and the backlight lamps are the wedge type 8 volt wedge type lamps that they find in the Sansui's. Uh, they were all good so I left them alone. I just cleaned it and uh, provides nice back backlighting for this. Now one more thing I noticed when I was repairing is the speaker connectors on the back. Three of them were broken. It looks like they were hit or maybe this thing was placed down on something and uh, there's some weight on them. But three of them had cracks so I took some mix up some epoxy uh, glued them back together. I don't know how well they're going to hold. They're a lot better than what they were. Um, if you look at it, you can't see the cracks. You have to look from underneath. But looking from above, you can't see the cracks. And uh, you just, you can't really tell. But now they're at least they're going to be a little more secure. Okay. Uh, next thing I want to mention is their quality control on what they're building. I wasn't impressed with the resistors in the preamp and I have a feeling that's the same for a lot of realistic equipment. Uh, the quality of the parts that go into this wasn't that great. The capacitors, here you can see the 77 capacitors I took out. Um, these are Delcons made in Korea. Uh, to me this is a garbage quality cap. They're all 85C so not very good there. Resistors, another another story. I had a lot of resistors I was testing. They were starting to go out of tolerance. They're 5% resistors, but not really well in the tolerance band. And they are drifty. When you heat them up, they drift a lot. So um, does one go through and replace all the resistors in this thing? That would be a huge job. I don't know if it's necessary. I don't think it's would gain you anything at this point. The receiver's working fine now. Um, I don't think changing resistors would would benefit you. We picked out the bad ones, we replaced them. Now it's working, so we're going to leave it alone. Uh, and yeah, and the, and the 77 of these capacitors, I did not touch the tuner. I left the tuner alone because, as far as I could tell, the tuner was working great. Uh, FM was working, AM's working, so I left that alone. Um, yeah, and I think the last thing is the cabinet. This is walnut veneer and it feels really rough like the grain has lifted so uh, one thing I did is I took some uh, Danish oil and I rubbed down this one side and it really made a big improvement on the appearance it gives it a little bit of a glow and I think I'm going to do that for the top and the other side as well I'll just get some Danish oil and rub down this cabinet and uh, give it 24 hours to dry and that should bring back a lot of the luster of the, the grain of the wood and uh, the glow, the glow of the wood, it should have a glow when it's viewed in the light. And this is pretty dull looking and uh, dull and flat looking. And once you put the Danish oil on, I think it's going to wake it up. So I'm going to do that as well after I've finished here. Thing for this now, I have to put it on my listening bench and listen to it for a week or two just to make sure everything's 100% before I give it back to the owner. Because um, there was a lot going on here and who knows maybe I missed something so I'm going to do that listening tests and then we can send it back to the owner all right so this is it for this one thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one take care